Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hot Topics and Best Practice in Pediatric Traumatic Brain Injury. We're bringing this to you from the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center, which is located on the Harborview Medical Center campus. And um, Harborview is uh, owned by King County and operated by the University of Washington School of Medicine. And we're thrilled to have so many of you join us today. Um, I'm the director of what we fondly call the HIPRC, um, spelt out in front of you here. And um, we're, I'd like to share with you a little bit about um, who we are and what we do, and, uh, and then proceed with today's agenda. So the mission of the HIPRC is to improve people's lives through research, education, training, and public awareness. And we've been around since 1985. Um, and this organization has made um, tremendous impactful contributions to the field of injury control. And the focus areas at our center currently are traumatic brain injury, which is one of the top, which is the topic we're talking about today, safe and active transport, which includes um, topics such as distracted driving, elderly driving, concussion and driving, um, auto pedestrian safety. Care of the injured patient, um, this meaning what's the best way to get people to the hospital, how should we take really good care of patients who are injured, and how do we make sure that they reintegrate back into their communities so that they lead productive and happy lives. The other important areas of work here at the center include violence prevention. Um, we have efforts ongoing in the area of, um, of gun violence. Um, and then global injuries. We're currently in a number of countries around the world uh, working on uh, real world uh, problems related to road traffic accidents um, and other forms of, of injuries and rehabilitation. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. We have about um, 80 faculty affiliated with the center here from 33 departments and schools uh, at the University of Washington. And we're very interdisciplinary. We train uh, residents, fellows, and postdoctoral students. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful environment for really reducing the injury burden. So if you're interested in future training or learning more about what we do, please visit our website um, at www.hiprc.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And um, we should be tweeting some of these activities today uh, so that you can follow along if you're interested. Importantly, a recording of this webinar is going to be posted on the HIPRC website, and we're offering continuing nursing education credit, um, and that's going to be available for a $45 administrative fee. Please, again, visit the website for updates um, about this. So the purpose of today's webinar um, is really to disseminate best practice in TBI, to discuss some of the hot topics, and hopefully these two will stimulate some a discussion on areas of needed research. And this work today is a collaboration between the Department of Health um, and, um, and us here at the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center to really begin a conversation about pediatric traumatic brain injury. Um, and we are going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how you're going to answer questions um, at the end of each presenter's presentation so that it can be an interactive session. And I will just say, this is the first time we've done this, so please bear with us if there are difficulties with technology, but I think you'll be able to let us know that. Um, we're really excited to be able to bring this to you. And um, and share share what we what we do here. So again, we when we started this collaboration with Will Hitchcock at the Department of Health, um, we weren't sure how many people were going to be interested. And um, you can see on the slide here, there are there are there are participants from 23 states across the country. 46 percent are from Washington State. Um, there are people here from California to New York and as far away from the UK, Bulgaria, Saudi Arabia, and we have a number of different professions represented here. 
physicians, nurses, public health professionals, students, educators, counselors, and in fact, there are family members of children who have been affected by TBI who have also registered. So it's really a great community today uh, to engage in this conversation and a, a wide array of organizations as well um, that you can see here. So thank you for being here and, and, and really welcome uh, to this inaugural um, webinar that we're doing here at the, uh, at the Injury Center. So here's a map. I thought we'd like to see this. Uh, we put this together last night. Um, you can see here that we've talked about 46% are from Washington State. We have 8% of our participants are from Alaska, so welcome. Um, we have participants from Hawaii. 15% um, are from Tennessee. So we seem to have a special connection here. We have to figure out what that's about and how to grow that relationship. 8% from Idaho, and then the rest are distributed from all across the country. And then, as I mentioned, um, the three countries uh, also. So thank you and, and welcome. So the, one of the reasons this is a very exciting agenda is because we have <clears throat> really uh, world-renowned and reputed speakers um, who are going to be talking about areas that, that they're very passionate about and that they make significant contributions to. So the morning schedule um, is up on your screen here. Uh, we'll begin with Dr. Rivara's presentation in a few minutes. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about um, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines and in-hospital management of severe traumatic brain injury. Dr. Ebel is going to address car seats and seat belts. Dr. Jenny on child abuse. We will pause for lunch between 12.10 and 12.40. Um, and this is Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Standard Time. Pacific Standard Time, Pacific Standard Time. Um, and then um, Will Hitchcock from the Department of Health will moderate the afternoon session um, with uh, a talk on rehabilitation, um, return to learn challenges and solutions, recommendations for return to play. Um, and then Dr. Shandro is going to be our last speaker talking about emergency stabilization for pediatric TBI. And then we'll conclude with remarks from Dr. Hitchcock from the Department of Health. So very important uh, in, information here. Um, at the end of each presentation, each presentation is approximately 30 minutes. Uh, one or two are a little bit longer. Uh, each of those ends with a live question and answer session. And I think there are instructions on how to, um, can you, Kunal, can you hand me the instructions on the question and answer? Here. Okay, great. So to ask a question, I think you're going to click the Q&A Zoom tool in the upper left corner of your browser. Um, and then, I think these are the same thing here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And this is going to open a text box to type and send your question to the presenter. <clears throat> and we probably will need to go through this again at the end of Dr. Rivara's talk and the other talks so that folks know how to get started if you haven't used this function before. So we're trying to make this a conversational engagement. Um, you know, it's not meant to be super formal, so please feel free and engage with us. Um, and I think um, we'll get ready to get started with our first presenter, who is Dr. Rivara. And just bear with us as we um, begin the transition from what I'm saying to, to his talk. This is Fred Rivar. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this to, to um, work properly here. Uh, 
Well, good morning. This is Fred Rivara. I hope that you can all hear me. I am a pediatrician and have been at the Injury Center since its inception. Today I'm going to talk with you about traumatic brain injury and public health and really the lead off speaker by trying to put this into perspective. Okay, I hope you can hear me and see me. And first slide here. So as you can see on this slide, this is from the CDC looking at the causes of injury death um, and it divided up by ages and the injury causes are highlighted. This is one that they have uh, from unintentional injuries, but you can also see the intentional injuries as well. And you can see that for children under one, one of the most common causes of injuries there is suffocation followed by homicide. And then as we get into the older age groups, you can see drowning and then motor vehicle traffic. And the motor vehicle traffic beginning at age five and really continuing on into age 24 is the most common cause of injury death. When we look at the causes of hospitalization, it's actually quite different. As you can see here, for um, all children under the age of 15, unintentional falls are the most common cause of injury hospitalization, followed by being struck against by something. And you can see for 15 and 24 year olds, that's reverse. Motor vehicle crashes are less common as a cause of hospitalization, but as you can see by the age of 15 to 24, they're the third most common cause of injury hospitalization. Now, TBI is, for pediatric, is an incredibly important cause of trauma deaths. Overall, a contributing factor in 30% of trauma deaths, but when we've looked at it for King County, TBI for pediatric trauma deaths accounts for 75%. And a large proportion of these trauma deaths actually occur at the scene. The rest occur in the hospital. When we look at the um, ratio of the number of kids injured to those proportion that die, you can see that the case fatality ratio for pediatric trauma overall is only about 1% for children that come into the hospital. But for TBI, it's three to five times as much, three to 5%. So TBI is a particularly serious cause of trauma for children. When we look at the causes of traumatic brain injury deaths, you can see by all ages, this is again data from the CDC, the yellow, blue, orange um, bar, you can see is motor vehicle traffic deaths. And of course, about 30% of those in kids under the age of five. And, and when you get to the age five to 14, you can see that it causes more than half of the, of the trauma deaths, and then slightly less than that for the 15 to 24 year olds. I think what's really, and Beth and Bell will be talking about um, prevention of motor vehicle um, traffic deaths in children. But what I think is really striking in this graph is this blue bar, is that for children under the age of five, that a very large portion of these trauma deaths are um, due to assaults. These are, these are homicides and due to child abuse. And you can see that the uh, fatal traumatic brain injury from assaults continues to be an important cause of deaths up until the age of 65. The uh, falls, and you'll see the second, the number of, of hospitalizations due to, 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 to TBI. For falls, it's really an uncommon cause of death, except when you get to be the middle age and the older age group. Struck by or against is really pretty uncommon. This is in contrast now to this, which is looking at TBI-related hospitalizations. And you can see here that falls now are by far and away for kids under age of five, the most common cause of hospitalization for traumatic brain injury. It continues to be an important cause for the five to 14 year olds and less so, and then become, becomes a common cause in the older population. The salts, as I showed you before, was a common cause of death. It's nevertheless a important cause of hospitalization, and these are again gonna be due to child abuse mostly, for the kids uh, under five, and then it becomes interpersonal violence in the 15 to 24 year olds, and then the 25 to 44 year olds. 
struck by and against is relatively uncommon in young kids, but becomes more common in the older kids. I think this graph shows it pretty well, is that for every time we have a death, um, we see 25 hospitalizations and almost 1,000 emergency department visits. So death really is only the tip of the iceberg. And important to look at these non-fatal injuries as well. These are some data that we did in a study a number of years ago. Tom Kepsel, our previous chair of epidemiology, was the lead author on this. And it's data based upon King County, Washington. And you can see that there are two kinds of traumatic brain injury displayed in this graph. Mild traumatic brain injury in the blue bar and moderate to severe traumatic brain injury in the red bar. And you can see that at all ages, the number of children who have mild traumatic brain injury far outweighs those that have moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. And this is important as we look later at the cost of traumatic brain injury and the um, disability resulting from traumatic brain injury in a population. But by far and away, the mild traumatic brain injury is the most common cause of, of, of traumatic brain injury in the population. Now, this um, name of mild traumatic brain injury is probably a misnomer. It's compared to moderate and severe traumatic brain injury, but we know that kids who have mild, mild traumatic brain injury can and do have some long-term problems. This is a um, graph from the CDC, again, showing emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths from traumatic brain injury. The top bar is the total. And you can see that hospitalizations and deaths have really re remained relatively flat over this period of over 10 years. But there was a, sp a spike in, hospital in emergency department visits for traumatic brain injury beginning in around 2007. And I think this is really related to the increased attention given to concussions. None of us feel like the rate of concussions has increased or the rate of traumatic brain injury has increased dramatically, but that this really reflects the increased attention and awareness of the whole concussion problem. And individuals and parents' concerns about concussions resulting in this increase in emergency department visits. What are the outcomes from traumatic brain injury and from trauma? We can see that overall, 10 to 25% of children with severe injuries have functional limitations. Of those who have low extremity fractures, about 30% have, have limitations compared to 15% of upper extremity injuries. Now, in my traumatic brain injury, 2% have um, functional impairments, 50% of those with moderate traumatic brain injury, and 90% of those with severe traumatic brain injury. In contrast with, adult, with adults, 50% of adults who have severe um, injuries are not back to work one year after um, their injury. Now, when you put together those two factors, you put together the high incidence of mild traumatic brain injury and then the high, um, and the, although there's still the relatively low disability, but, two, two, but nevertheless, people do have disability after mild traumatic brain injury. You can see that in children, if you look at the population-based incidence, this is incidence per 100,000, that the disability from traumatic brain injury is actually most impactful in the population in terms of the mild traumatic brain injury. And you can see this for each age group. Again, this is not to discount the important disability that we have for moderate and severe traumatic brain injury that Molly Fuentes and others will be talking about later. But in terms of the population impact, because mild traumatic brain injury is so common, the, um, the impact of that is really going to be seen greater in the population than is the mild traumatic brain injury. And then you look at the cost of traumatic brain injury, you can see that the mean cost per um, hospitalization is greatest than the severe, which obviously makes sense that children with mild traumatic brain injury, their costs of most of those children are not hospitalized and their costs are relatively small. Well, every child with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury is hospitalized and the children with severe traumatic brain injury have continued costs because of rehabilitation needs after their acute hospitalization. But again, when you look at this in a population level, you can see that mild traumatic brain injury in a population has the greatest cost because, again, it's by far and away the most common cause of traumatic brain injury. A moderate um, has the lowest cost because, again, the, the cost per injury is less than that for severe, um, but severe has the highest, has a higher cost than moderate because the costs are much greater in those with severe traumatic brain injury than those with moderate traumatic brain injury.
But again, because this impact of the mild traumatic brain injury is so great, both in terms of disability and in terms of cost, it's one of the reasons that there's been a great deal of attention to the problem in the last few years. Now, when we talk about injuries, we like to use the term injury control and not just injury prevention. And the idea of injury control encompasses prevention, acute care, and rehabilitation. So when an individual um, is injured, we try to take care as best we can in terms of the acute care of the injury and then um, get persons um, back to their highest level of functioning through the use of rehabilitation, but then starting the cycle with an increased risk of further injuries. So we're really going to be talking today about prevention, acute care, and rehabilitation. I'm going to start off by talking about prevention. But then Monica Babalala and Dr. Chandra, the last speaker, will be talking about acute care and um, rehabilitation. Dr. Um, Fuentes will be talking about that as well as Dr. Herring. I'll be talking about prevention in general, and then Dr. Um, Abel will be talking about prevention of motor vehicle crashes. I want to put into perspective the importance of prevention. There have been a a lot of work on the care of patients with traumatic brain injury. Dr. Babalala will be talking about the um, evidence-based care of these individuals. But it's important to realize that we can't really reverse the injury that happens. And there's been a lot of studies um, that have been conducted in the last decade to try to improve the outcome of individuals, whether they be children or adults with traumatic brain injury. And I put this slide up for us to be realistic about what we can actually accomplish in the emergency department, the ward, and the ICU, and to again emphasize the importance of prevention. There's a large crash study of over 25,000 individuals done internationally looking at whether steroids would um, improve the outcomes and found out that steroids did not improve the outcomes of individuals suffering traumatic brain injury. The Cool Kids study, which was um, a study of hypothermia, trying to cool individuals after a traumatic brain injury. This has been a um, technique that's now been used for hypoxic injury in young infants in ENH where it's effective, but in traumatic brain injury, it's not been found to be effective. There was a pilot study suggesting that progesterone administered right after um, traumatic brain injury would be effective in terms of improving outcome. That was shown to have no effect. Erythropoietin has been shown to be effective in neonates, again, with hypoxic injury, but a study of it in um, Older individuals with traumatic brain injury showed no effect. Even intracranial pressure monitoring, which Dr. Valvala will be talking, um, there's a large study done by um, Randy Chesnut at Harbor View down in South America and really showed questionable or even no effects of, of intracranial pressure monitoring. And then the last gasp of neurosurgery is to do a decompressive craniectomy, basically remove the skull, do control intracranial pressure monitoring, and there was no effect upon mortality, and the individual who, who survived seemed to have worse outcomes. So again, not to make this appear like interventions are futile, but to emphasize that we really have a long way to go into devising appropriate interventions that really make an impact upon injury outcome, and to emphasize the importance of prevention. So in terms of prevention, what can we do to prevent traumatic brain injury to children and adolescents? There have been some successes, and probably the thing that we're best known for at the Injury Center has been our bicycle helmet program. I'll talk a little bit about fall prevention um, and the importance of it, talk a little bit about pedestrian injuries, and then Dr. Bell later will talk about motor vehicle occupant protection. There have been some failures, and I think it's important that we acknowledge these failures, that firearms are a very important cause of traumatic brain injury usually fatal traumatic brain injury, both in the state of Washington as well as across the country. There are disparities in the rate of traumatic brain injury and the outcomes, which really need to be addressed. And then really the, one of the failures is, is that there are a lot of things that we know do work to prevent injuries, whether they be helmets or um, use of seatbelts or, or car seats, but there has been not complete implementation of these across all groups in America and around the world. So our first successful prevention campaign that I mentioned was the effectiveness of bicycle helmets. We conducted some case control studies and showed that helmets really are incredibly effective. They prevent 85% of brain injuries, 88% of, of 85% of head injuries, 88% of brain injuries. 
They prevent severe brain injuries. They work whether or not there's a motor vehicle crash or a fall. So really, they are incredibly effective devices. You don't have to spend a huge amount of money on these. These helmets are um, effective even when you buy a, a lower cost helmet in Target or or Kmart, Toys R Us. These things are effective. And here's a graph showing that a campaign to promote helmet use really can be quite effective. You can see when we first started our campaigns back in 1986, about 2% of people were helmeted. And through a combination of educational programs, promoting discounts um, with, with retail outlets and educational programs in the community through pediatricians, and then finally accompanied by legislation, um, requiring helmet use in certain jurisdictions of the, in the area of the state, we found that we can increase helmet use to be very high. So helmets is really a success story. And, and unfortunately, I think that we've become a little bit complacent about helmet use. I think most kids in America probably own bicycle helmets, but they don't all use them. And I think it's something that we really should, again, particularly with the summer coming upon us now, emphasize the importance of helmet use for bicycling and for other sports where head injuries can occur, such as skateboarding or roller skating and line skating. Pediatric falls are an important problem. Um, two weeks ago when I was on service at Harborview, we had four children come in one, one week with falls out of windows when the weather got hot in Seattle. As many of us know who live in Seattle because we don't have insects um, and um, we just have window screens. We don't have air conditioning because it doesn't usually get that hot in Seattle. Windows get opened up and they um, kids fall out of them. The most common risk factors for um, falls out of windows was this was based upon a case control study that I brought, done by Brian Johnston, the editor of injury prevention or chief of pediatrics at Harborview. He found that sliders where windows are slid laterally to open was a really common cause of, of window falls compared to windows that were cranked open. And then the window screens being present. Now, most parents would feel like if you have a window screen in place, that that's going to prevent the child from falling out of the window. It's important to realize that window screens are actually meant to pop out um, as a fire safety code. So the window um, screens pop out, and when children lean against them, that they um, pop out and the children fall. Deeper window sills um, are a risk factor, I think, because children sit on the window sills and again, the screens pop out and they fall. So I think the, the issue here in terms of prevention is to put devices on the windows where they can't be opened up as, as wide as they could be without those devices. These are available, they're cheap, and they're available in all stores like at Lowe's or Home Depot and really to be recommended. Other falls um, risks are baby walkers. I think they're less commonly than they used to be, but parents can still buy these at garage sales, and we used to see many of these kinds of injuries. Unfortunately, I think they've become less common as baby walkers have gradually disappeared. But we still certainly see falls downstairs, and the use of stair gates is really critically important to prevent those kinds of injuries. One of the most common causes of serious brain injuries that we see from motor vehicle crashes is not in occupants, but in pedestrians. The group really like greatest risk are children under the age of 10. And we found through a number of studies that there are certain risk factors for um, crosswalk for, for pedestrian injuries in kids. One is it turns out is kind of what you might think contrary to, to common thought is that more crosswalks actually increase the risk of pedestrian injuries. And I think the reason is, is that the pedestrian thinks that cars will stop. Kids almost think that there's steel barriers erected when you cross a crosswalk. But it turns out that um, most cars don't stop for pedestrians and crosswalks. And I think particularly risky is where there are two lanes of traffic in each direction. The inner lane may um, stop, but the outer the outer lane may stop, but the inner lane doesn't. And the child starts venturing across the um, intersection at the crosswalk, and unfortunately is then hit because the cars don't all stop. I think the same thing is present, is the risk factor for when pedestrian signals are present. Again, the pedestrian feels like these provide a great deal of pre prevention, but they don't prevent injuries from cars turning left or right or on red. Um, so that's really a problem. Sidewalks and poor, and poor repair are a problem because 
of the fact then that people don't use those, they walk in the street. Bus stops on blocks are an important risk of pedestrian injuries because people get off the bus, people, cars can't see um, beyond the, the large bus that blocks their view. People venture out behind the bus and unfortunately get hit. Dr. Bell has been an expert on distracted driving. We've actually conducted a study on distracted walking. Um, we had one of our graduate students conduct the study and found out that um, this is a common cause of distraction. Many people use um, cell phones, particularly texting or crossing the streets. We know as a result, they don't look where they're going. Um, and this poses real risk of pedestrian injuries that really we need to address. Poverty is certainly a risk factor for pedestrian injuries. Here's a, a study from an AVID actually in Montreal, and it shows that both for males and females, for kids of all ages, that the children in the highest um, income areas have the lowest risk of pedestrian injuries. Here is the poorest, highest, and you can see for all groups that the poorest areas of the city result in a higher rate of pedestrian injuries. And I think this is due to the fact that these areas have higher risk, have higher density of traffic. The traffic is often moving in um, more rapid, more at a higher rate of speed than in, than in, in poorer, than in um, richer areas of the city. That richer areas of the city, there's often um, traffic control devices such as um, barriers, um, one-way streets, other ways of slowing down traffic that are not present in, in poor areas that have higher density of high moving, fast moving traffic. Pedestrian injury prevention, um, it's really been tough. I've spent uh, many years trying to look at that. I think we now have back over, um, backup cameras and sensors that really are effective and can be reduce the risk of pedestrian injury by 30, 40%. Though I think that parents have to realize that they may not be effective for right behind the vehicle. They may be effective for 10 feet behind the vehicle, but not necessarily a child that's right up against the bumper of the vehicle. Safe routes to school programs are, certainly have been effective in reducing pedestrian and bicycle injuries. And I think this is something that every community can implement. I and others have done studies trying to change children and pedestrian safety, and we found out that they work, but they only work some of the time. And I think we have to realize that for five to nine year old children, some of the time it's not a good enough, that you can help them to become safer pedestrians, but you can't trust them to cross streets safely all the time. So parents need to be aware of this and really make sure they're restricting where their children that age walk. What about other kinds of, of traumatic brain injury? Well, I think an important one is suicide and suicide by guns. I've shown this graph here, which shows on the x-axis, household firearm ownership, and the y-axis, firearm deaths from um, both homicide and suicide. Here's the state of Washington. You can see in particularly rural areas of the country, that they have a high rate of firearm ownership and they have a high rate of firearm death. In Hawaii and Massachusetts, they have lower rates of firearm ownership and lower rates of death. So there is a direct correlation between firearm ownership and risk of firearm death. In the United States, as you can see from this slide, overall about half of the firearm, I'm sorry, half of the suicides are due to firearms. Overall, in the United States, about 63% of, of the firearm deaths are due to suicide. In the state of Washington, it's about 80% are due to suicide. But nationally, as you can see, is that half the suicides are due to firearms, half are not firearm means, and the group at greatest risk of firearm death are actually white males over the age of 65. This is a data from a case control study that we did a number of years ago, and you can see that for um, zero to 24 year olds, having a gun in the home increases the risk of firearm death by tenfold. That having history of mental illness, having a gun in the home increases the risk of, of firearm death threefold, but in homes that, where there's no one that has a history of mental illness, having a gun in the home increases the risk of firearm of, of suicide death by 33-fold. You can see that safe storage gun does make a difference. Having guns loaded versus unloaded 
Um, you can see increases the risk of suicide ninefold, having guns that are unlocked versus having no guns, increases the risk of death sixfold. So storage of guns really can make a difference. And this emphasizes some studies done by Garen Wintemute emphasizes the point of easy access to guns increases the risk of suicide death. Um, and you can see here is that having a people that buy a gun, the risk of suicide is 57 fold higher in the first week after um, the purchase of the gun compared to not having a gun before. In the state of Washington, in the state of Washington and Seattle, we know that 93% of people who try to commit suicide with a gun are being successful. So there's really very little that we can do to treat a patient with a firearm injury to the brain. The key really is therefore prevention. And these data, I think, are striking. This is a study where individuals interviewed um, patients who tried to commit suicide, but fortunately failed to commit suicide, and found out that between the time that individuals decided to commit suicide and, and made the attempt, 24% were less than five minutes, and 70% were within one hour. So this clearly um, shows that suicide is really a very impulsive act. Showing the case fatality rate from, from um, suicide, firearms, it's 93%. Suffocation or hanging is 69% compared to using pills, it's only 2%. So this is what we call means matter. The means you use to try to commit suicide really do matter. If you try to commit suicide using a gun, you're going to be successful nearly all the time. Or if you try to slit your wrist or use pills, you're going to be successful very rarely. And this kind of puts up a little bit of a, a um, theoretical model of how this really might affect suicide risk if we substitute a non-lethal means. If we substitute non-lethal mean, non means, few attempts prove fatal. And the important point here is that 89 to 95% of people who try to commit suicide don't go on to die by suicide. So if you can have... Um, you can get rid of lethal means, people turn to less lethal means, and nearly all the people who use less lethal means will not die from the suicide at that time or eventually. Um, they go on to leave full lives. So that's why prevention is really key, and safe storage, I think, is the one thing that we all can agree on, regardless of where we are in the political spectrum, regardless of where our patients are in the political spectrum. I think everyone, whether you be an NRA member or not, all agree that guns should be stored safely. And it's really up to us as healthcare providers to make sure we push that message. So in summary, TBI is a common problem, an important cause of childhood disability and death. Treatment cannot reverse the injury. Prevention is key. We need to follow data and focus on the most frequent causes and focus on the interventions that are effective. Thank you, and I'll take questions now. At this point, I don't see any questions. Thank you so much, Fred, for um, for that wonderful presentation. I didn't get a chance to officially introduce you before we started, so let me just thank you for all your contributions to the field of injury control. Um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Rivara, he's a professor of pediatrics and vice chair in the department here at the University of Washington, and a really a, a thought leader and groundbreaking contributor with who has done impactful research um, throughout his career. And bicycle helmets, uh, all that work was really born out of the work that he did here at the Injury Center, which translated to, to national policy. And um, so it's really an honor to have you participate. And Thank you. with that, I will transition. Uh, we'll put the transition slide up and maybe uh, take questions. Is that right? We do have some questions here. There's one question about can you share more about the distracted pedestrian study? And this was a study we did in. Um, I hope you all can hear me. 
This was a study we did in Seattle where we had um, research assistants go out into the community and watch pedestrians crossing. And we looked at pedestrians at all ages and we found out that um, pedestrians, when there was a very high rate of, of, I think it was about 20% of pedestrians actually were on their cell phones, either talking or looking at the cell phones or texting while they were crossing the street. And we found out that the time to cross the street was significantly um, longer in those who were using their, their cell phones, which makes sense. We all know when we, we see people walking on the street that they um, tend to walk a lot slower when they're texting. Um, so it really ended up being a very important cause of, of distraction for pedestrians. And Beth will be talking later about distraction for people uh, driving as well. Are there any other questions? Well, let's see, there's one here. Um, has there been any studies on the effect of poverty? Yes, there has been, as I, I showed you, that clearly poverty affects injury risks across the board, regardless of, your, of the injury. And um, I think that for pedestrian injury, it's clearly um, a increased risk of, of pedestrian injuries in poor areas. For traumatic brain injury, in general, there's an increased risk in, in poor families, and I think it's because they're less likely to use or have access to um, safety devices for their children. Yes, we will have access to your slides. Another question was on the prevention of child abuse. Dr. Jenny will be talking about the um, prevention of child abuse later. And I won't steal her thunder about that, um, but just to say that probably the single most effective thing we have to prevent child abuse is the nurse family partnership, which is um, a project that was spearheaded by David Oles in, in Colorado. And it's really where we have nurse home visitors going out during the pregnancy and continuing throughout the first child's first two years of life. And it's really the single most effective thing we can do to prevent child abuse. Someone else asked about the use of hyperbaric chambers post TBI. Um, there really hasn't been any large randomized controlled studies of that, but there's no evidence right now that, that would be effective. The one time that we use hyperbaric chambers um, is um, in individuals who are admitted with smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning. And even then, it's unclear whether or not that's effective. But it's, there's clearly no data to um, suggest that using hyperbaric chambers for an individual who has severe TBI would be effective at all. And in fact, it might be harmful because you clearly can't deliver the level of ICU care to an individual while they're in the chamber that you can do when they're up in the ICU. We're going to wait for a few more minutes to see um, if there are any other questions from the participants or audience. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box um, because we have time to have a good discussion here. So one of the other questions was the single best way to educate the community to reduce traumatic brain injuries. I think that it's it's not, um, there isn't a single best way. I think that in injury prevention, what we found is that you can't sort of talk about injury prevention in, in general. You really need to focus on specific action that, that individuals and families can take. So for the youngest kids, I think it really is having your children buckled up in car seats from the day they leave the hospital and continuing to have them buckled up in car seats and then transitioning to booster seats and then to seat belts. It is using helmets. Um, it's using helmets for bicycling, for, for rollerboarding, for skating. And now there's a really good push to use helmets when kids are out there skiing, using helmets when individuals are on motorcycles. 
It is um, preventing falls, I think, by, again, when children are um, infants to make sure that they're not left alone on the changing tables or on the beds. And then as kids get older, I think using the window guards um, to prevent falls out of windows. And for guns, I think it's really um, is safe storage. Seattle Children's Hospital has spearheaded an effort to promote safe storage. We are doing events where we give out storage devices for free. We followed up two weeks later with those individuals who received the storage device and found out that in fact their devices are being used. So safe storage is a program that really is effective. Um, so I think you really need to talk about specific um, injury prevention programs for children. It's really best done when they're at that developmental stage. So there's another question that's being posted about it. What's the best way of, to keep your child from learning to how to unbuckle the seatbelt? This seems to happen a lot. Well, I think that the, the best way is to make a rule, first of all, that everyone in the car is belted. We know that parents are important role models and that they are, um, need to be belted to well protect themselves and serve as role model for their children. And secondly, if the child does unbuckle the car seat or the seat belt, is to stop the car. So to pull over, stop the car, and buckle the, the child back in um, and keep on doing that until the child learns. I think that like any child, any behavior that you want to extinguish in a child, you um, don't reward the child who has the belt, seat belt unbuckled. If the child continually does that, well, don't take them on the shopping trip. But I think that you just will persist it, and I feel that that's going to be effective. Another question that we got is um, prevention of post-traumatic um, stress disorder. And this is a important problem. I think that it's under, under uh, appreciated. We know that about um, 20 to 30 percent of people, including adolescents and adults, will have post-traumatic stress disorder even a year after um, traumatic brain injury or any kind of an injury. I think that the issue there is recognizing that it happens for uh, healthcare providers to screen individuals after they get out of the hospital um, for the injury and to see whether or not they're having problems, to normalize it as being uh, frequent problems, and to get appropriate counseling. We usually believe in a uh, stepped up approach to, to treating people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, initially starting with cognitive behavioral therapy, and then if that's in itself is not totally effective, is progressing on to adding uh, medications, usually um, SSRIs. But post-traumatic stress disorder can be treated. Um, the important thing is to screen for it and to recognize it when it's occurring. Now the question is, how common do infants have TBIs from falls from beds and changing tables? Most every parent I know has had their child experience a fall from that. Well, I think it's a little different from falls from beds than from falls from changing tables. Falls from beds usually are obviously a lower height than are falls from um, a changing table. Usually in a bedroom, there's usually carpeting, changing tables, and not only carpeting underneath it. Falls from beds can um, cause a traumatic brain injury. It's uncommon, um, but it can happen. Falls from changing tables are, I think, uh, uh, potentially more serious. I can tell you just an experience that I had a number of years ago in clinic where a child fell off an examining table about the same height as a um, changing table, and the child sustained a skull fracture wasn't a terrible brain injury, but it can happen. And so I think that changing tables, it's to um, make sure the child is never left there alone. For the for beds, really understand that child beginning at three to four years of age, or three to four months of age are going to start rolling and to make sure the child's not left alone, even in the middle of, of a bed, a large bed. Children can roll, they can scoot, and they can get into trouble. We all love our kids, we love our grandkids, and it's important to make sure that we take best care of them. So use beds that have railings on them, use changing tables that have railings on them. Another question, are there particular toys such as trampolines that have been common culprits for a traumatic brain injury? I'm glad that you mentioned trampolines because trampolines are really a terrible problem. The um, trampolines are a dangerous device. I would recommend that 
families never use these devices, um, that their injuries on trampolines are relatively common, and there are different kinds of injuries. Um, there are, are broken bones are fairly common. Children can fall off of these and hit the side rail even with padding, padding or they can fall through the ground and sustain a traumatic brain injury. And then of course, the, the terrible consequence of having a spinal cord injury that can happen to children on trampolines. We've all seen these kinds of injuries. Um, and, and even though parents um, like to have these devices for the kids, they may have a cage around the trampoline, they have padded, padded sides. Trampolines are a inherently dangerous device. And I would recommend that families not buy trampolines for their children, not let their kids use trampolines when they go over to their friends' houses. They really are never safe. Other kinds of toys um, that have been found to be at risk for a traumatic brain injury, there were at one point um, these lawn darts. There was a family whose child had a severe injury from a lawn dart, and they were subsequently taken off the market. I think that most toys that are really truly toys have been carefully looked at by the Consumer Product Safety Commission and don't pose a great risk for traumatic brain injury. I think the common quotes toys that kids use would be bicycles, skateboards, roller skates, and there's a traumatic risk of traumatic brain injury in those use of those devices. And again, using a helmet really can dramatically decrease that risk. I'm actually in New York City right now and thinking about window falls. There was a campaign many years ago in New York City called Children Can't Fly, which resulted in a legislation by the New York City Health Department that required every um, apartment that was above the second floor to have bars on the windows to prevent children from falling out of windows. It was usually successful. And so I think trying to have window guards or importantly windows that, that are prevented from opening up very wide is probably the most important way to prevent window falls, which again, are really common. I, I think um, we see more than a dozen of these a year at Harborview, the regional trauma center. Fred, um, I was wondering, this is Monica, um, hello from Seattle. <laughs> um, can you comment where you think the field ought to move um, in terms of injury prevention for head injury? What are some questions that we ought to be thinking about? That's a, that's a really good question. I, I think that one of the things to do is um, looking at safe storage of guns and really trying to figure out how we can get more um, homes that have guns to use safe storage. Safe storage is really something that families feel pediatricians can talk to them about. It has been shown to be quite effective. Most families really uh, are amenable to advice about it. I think the question is how do we get families to, to use those devices. I think for um, motor vehicle crashes, Beth is going to talk about that, but I think we have a huge problem now in distracted driving. And the, the mortality rate from motor vehicle crashes for the last century decreased steadily. In the last two years, it actually has increased. And all the people that are, um, are knowledgeable about this problem ascribe it to the fact that people are on their cell phones in their cars and are distracted. In terms of, of um, safe storage program, um, we, as I said, have this program through Children's and Harborview, and you can contact uh, us at Harborview or Chelsea Gallagher at Children's Hospital. Um, to and We're happy to provide you kind of how-to information about doing these safe storage programs. They really are very successful. We hold these safe storage programs in sporting goods stores that sell guns. Um, again, we're not trying to 
take away people's Second Amendment rights or saying you shouldn't own a gun. That's a separate issue. We're just saying if you do own a gun, we want you to store it safely. So I think um, I'd just like to thank Dr. Rivara thank you for very much for the chance to talk with you. What's that? Thank you for the chance to talk with you. Oh, it's 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 really been great, and thank you for taking the time from from New York City. And um, hopefully, you'll you'll be able to have a have some fun time too. Thank you. We're preparing for our next segment um, on of this program. So um, just bear with us while we transition. Thank you.